Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have you all with us for today's webinar, Extreme Heat and Early Childhood Development, a discussion on rising temperatures and strategies for supporting development and lifelong health. Whether you're joining us for the first time or have been a regular at our webinars here on the, at the Center on the Developing Child, we are very happy to have you with us today. So today's webinar is grounded in the first working paper from the Early Childhood Scientific Council on Equity and the Environment. The council is a multidisciplinary group that synthesizes and communicates about emerging science that can help to improve our understanding of how influences from the broader environment affect early childhood development and also lifelong health. The Council's first working paper, published earlier this year, focuses on the many ways that heat can affect development, including its impacts on young children's biological systems and how it can amplify the effects of systemic inequities. The paper offers strategies to mitigate the impact of extreme temperatures and points toward actionable solutions for cooling the communities where children live, grow, learn, and play. And we look forward to diving into these strategies throughout today's conversation. We will share a link to the working paper and a related action guide in the chat, and you can keep an eye on that space throughout today's webinar for other relevant resources. We also wanted to thank a minute to thank those of you who submitted questions for our panel when registering for this event. We received over 100 submitted questions, many of which we will be addressing throughout the conversation today. And we hope um, that you will stay on for a quick minute at the end of today's discussion to share your feedback in a brief survey, uh, which I will pop back on to share before we conclude. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our panel, starting with a note that while we had hoped to be joined today by Dr. Agora Basu, he was unfortunately unable to be here. Uh, we do have with us Dr. Lindsay Burkhart, who is Chief Science Officer at the Center on the Developing Child, where she develops and leads the center's scientific agenda. She is also founding director of the Early Childhood Scientific Council for Equity and the Environment and leads their efforts to synthesize and communicate about the scientific mechanisms related to how children's environments shape their development. Dr. Burkhart engages regularly with diverse stakeholders and audiences with the aim of making this science both accessible and actionable. She is also a practicing primary care pediatrician in the community outside of Boston. Dr. Burkhart is joined today by Dr. Kari Nato, who is chair of the Department of Environmental Health and John Rock Professor of Climate and Population Studies at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Nato is a practicing clinician specializing in allergy, asthma, and immunology in children and adults, and she has published over 400 papers, many in the field of climate change and health. For more than 30 years, she has devoted herself to understanding how environmental and genetic factors affect the risk of developing allergies and asthma, especially wildfire-induced air pollution. Her laboratory has been studying air pollution and wildfire effects on children and adults, including wildland firefighters. Dr. Nato is also a member of the Early Childhood Scientific Council on Equity and the Environment, and we are very happy to have her here with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Burkhardt to begin our discussion. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation today. Thrilled to have Kari here with us. I'm just going to start by setting the stage a little bit for why this feels like such a timely and important conversation, and then we'll dive right in. You know, I think many of us have recognized from our own experiences that temperatures are rising around the world. And, you know, science is confirming we're having record setting heat waves that are happening more often and they're lasting longer than they have ever before. So I think with these increasing temperatures and with the increased frequency of these events, it makes this topic really timely and important because it's something that's already affecting kids and their caregivers today. And we know that excessive heat impacts kids' development both in the moment, but also potentially across their lifespan. And the good news is that there's a lot of solutions that already exist and that communities are putting into effect already with really good re results. So we're gonna talk today about how extreme heat affects development, the potential effects in pregnancy and throughout early childhood, and then get into some of those actionable solutions. And thinking about how heat works to affect development, we really know that it starts with an understanding that environments influence all children's development 
by shaping the exposures and the experiences that, that they have. And this developmental environment is really the full range of exposures and experiences that they have in places where they live and learn and play and grow. And so what's surrounding children is quite literally shaping their biology. But importantly, you know, these experiences and exposures can be positive or they can be negative. So environments can have exposures and experiences that fuel positive development. Things like really strong foundational relationships with their caregivers and access to green space and breathing clean air, or they can be more negative and potentially derail development. So things like extreme heat or breathing toxic air from wildfire smoke. So climate change is coming in and it's creating and shaping changes to this environment of exposures and experiences. And it's really important to understand too that these effects are not only direct on their biology, like breathing in their toxic wildfire smoke, but they're also indirect in that things like extreme weather events and flooding can cause displacement that then places enormous stress on caregivers, which then has an important effect on those foundational relationships. And when it comes to climate change, this is just the first in a series of conversations that we're hoping to have about how climate change is shaping developmental environments. And today we're gonna to talk about heat. And Kari, it's just so amazing and special to have you join this conversation as just really an expert and really thoughtful thought leader in the space. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a pediatrician, I'm a parent. I've lived and dealt with heat stress myself as well as climate change. So I'm really happy to be here. As the Department Chair of Environmental Health, we work a lot with climate change and the global environment. And so our health is inextricably related to Earth's health. And we need to really focus on early development of children. And today I'll talk a little bit about how heat, specifically heat stress affects children. Because now with climate change here on our planet, every child, born today will suffer from at least one severe weather condition associated with climate change, and most likely that will be heat. You, I'm sure, all heard on the news that last summer was the hottest summer on record for our Earth. And unfortunately, it will likely be the coolest summer on record for our Earth in the future. So, we not only have to talk about solutions today, but we absolutely must talk about how those solutions affect children and pregnant women and how it affects the early development of the child. So I'm excited, Lindsay, for your wonderful seminar today and happy to answer any questions from you as well as from the audience at the end. Yeah, thanks, Kari. And actually, I'm going to hopefully um, intersperse. We got so many amazing questions that really helped to guide how we shaped the discussion today. And one question that I get a lot um, that came up quite frequently from the audience when it comes to heat is, what do we mean? Like when we say extreme heat or excessive heat, what does that mean? How are people thinking about definitions and how do we kind of start from a common understanding? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we talk about heat, especially in babies that tend to have a lot of extra tissue around, especially with children who are moving around and toddlers who are on the move. Typically, what we call heat that could affect them physically, mentally, in a, in a way that's not good for their bodies is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what people think above which, if you're exercising and moving a lot, it can actually be a problem for your health. So 85 degrees Fahrenheit is really where we keep the threshold. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think, you know, the next question that usually follows is, what about places where it's been warm for quite a while? You know, how do we think about heat differently? You know, if you're somebody listening in from someplace like Boston, that's typically more cool and dry, how do we think about heat and children's, the way that they're going to experience these increasing temperatures differently or the same as a child who um, has, has always lived or whose family has always lived in a place that it's typically more humid or hot. Right. So as we all know, we grow up in areas of the world with certain cultural habits. And we also make sure that our children are part of those cultural habits as a family. And those are good things. We're part of that overall environment to take care of the next generation. And with that, for example, in Boston, we tend to have colder weather in New England. But the problem with 85 degrees is if it's in April, 
versus July, where we're prepared in July to have warmer weather. People already have their clothes out, their shorts or bathing suits, have pools open. But in April, not so much in the middle of Boston. And so people are used to having colder weather. So therefore, they're going to dress their children and dress themselves up with warmer type layers of clothing. And so that's a problem because part of dealing with heat physiologically is to evaporate our sweat. And if we can't evaporate our sweat, especially for babies and toddlers, because they're not just little adults, they have different ways of evaporating from their skin because they don't have as much skin surface area. So it's actually more dangerous for children not to be prepared for these high temperatures in areas of the world that they're not used to that. For example, in Switzerland, there were places in the Alps that had absolutely no air conditioning ever. They just didn't have it because they never thought they need it. And two years ago, they had summer conditions of greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit and people were not ready. So the children had terrible heat stress and heat exhaustion uh, just because people aren't ready. And so we need to, Lindsay, think about preparing the rest of the world. You're right. There are places in the global majority and near the equator that are used to heat, but they've already adapted the methods to be able to deal with heat that I'll talk about later on today Mm. because those are methods that have been central to the ecological knowledge of that community that now we have to be humble and listen to so that we ourselves can take the st- same steps to protect our children. Yeah. And that makes so much sense too. in thinking about like, you know, we're used to something in July that we're not prepared for in April or even in October. And I think in Boston in particular, we experienced this when it came to our schools and our early care and education settings, which by design were made to keep heat in, you know, yeah. and so and are not adapted then to kind of handle those higher temperatures at times of the year where children are more accustomed to spending time inside. So I'm excited to get into that, um, you know, a little bit later on. So can you talk about, you know, under the skin, how does our body respond, you know, when temperatures increase and how is that different? How is the um, response different, as you mentioned, in really young children? especially infants who have different physiology. Yeah, so on one side, when we deal with stressors, um, our body handles stress in some similar ways. So there's just a certain pathway that when we deal with early life stressors, it's similar. With heat, there are end pathways that are very similar to other stress pathways. So what I like to think about is these types of life stressors that affect children, especially early on. So, and the reason we know so much of this biology is because unfortunately animals out um, in animal husbandry and agriculture have dealt a lot with heat stress and so have their babies. And so we know a lot about mammals and how babies uh, have to deal with heat stress. And so biologically, what will happen, especially even after three exposures of heat waves of 85 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, where you're dealing with overheating for more than two days in a row. With that in mind, we've seen that these proteins called heat shock proteins can get activated. And the reason I don't want you all to have to know the molecular mechanisms here, but the important thing is, is it's real. It's documented. We've documented it in animals. We've documented it in human babies. Heat shock proteins get activated. And why is that important? Because these are stressor proteins that are meant to keep everything stable, to keep everything happy in our blood. The minute that they get stressed, the minute that the heat goes up, then unfortunately, they start to activate a pathway that inflames our body. And inflammation is not good. I hope that none of you have to suffer through inflammation, but it can result in disease. It can result in autoimmunity. It can result in allergies. It can result in gut problems and skin problems. So when our immune system is not happy, it's not good for a baby, good for a toddler. It's also the heat itself. Those heat shock proteins are in the brain. So they can also affect cognition and mental health. So unfortunately, our human body um, is not meant for high amounts of heat. And you could say, well, we learned that the human body stays at an equal temperature 
And that when we have a fever, we have heat. And when children have a fever, they deal with high amounts of heat. That's true. But it's not continual. It's not for five days constantly, for example. And if you don't hydrate, if you don't have opportunities to try to decrease that heat, that's what can lead to trouble. And what we're finding is that that can be irreversible in babies and in toddlers because they're so sensitive to heat. Wow. And those heat shock proteins themselves too have important functions, right? Like they protect your hemoglobin, like other things that are really important in making your other body systems down. So it's sort of this really interconnected series of effects, it seems like. Yeah, that's right. So these heat shock proteins are kind of nannies and caretakers for other things in your blood yeah. and kind of there patrolling the universe to make sure everything else stays really stable and the proteins don't turn into denatured yeah. protein. And and why, why do I say denatured? Well, if everyone has basically cooked an egg or made egg whites into a whip, they know that if you whip things up, that egg white can actually turn into a foam. And that's what I mean. If you heat up the human body too much, especially in children, your other proteins start to turn into foam and that's not good. And yeah. so these heat <laughs> proteins are meant to take care of that. And when they're disrupted, when they're too hot, they can't. So it leads to big problems. Yeah. It's amazing that we understand that at that cellular level. Um, you know, what are, when we think about heat, especially in these sensitive groups, thinking about even before birth, right? What are the effects of heat on pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes, because those of us who think about young children, you know, think about how early brain development really starts and how we can both understand the impacts and then think about protecting groups that might be especially sensitive to heat. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's really important because as we think about the ways that um, heat affects infants, toddlers, early development, it really does start uh, a lot of the times in utero. And looking at maternal health is critical. When a woman is pregnant, her heat exchange is different. Mm -hmm. And for us that remember being pregnant, you get hot much faster because your metabolism is, is higher. You're pumping out much more blood than another typical person that's not pregnant. And you're also carrying a lot more weight. And so that's hard to release heat as well as other people that aren't pregnant. And you're also taking care of another, um, you know, the sort of whole organism. And so with that in mind, people that are pregnant have much more sensitivities to heat. So when I talk 85 degrees Fahrenheit, we actually don't know the threshold for pregnant women, but we do know that pregnant women exposed to heat waves, for example, 100 degrees more than three days in a row. And if they haven't been given or afforded, the ability to get inside, to hydrate, to be in cool rooms, that can lead to prematurity of the child. That can lead to, unfortunately, um, sometimes premature deaths of the baby and can lead to health issues of the mother herself. So with blood pressure changes and other aspects to her health that needs to be taken care of right away. So heat has a direct effect on um on pregnant women. And importantly, we don't know enough about how that affects the child that's born uh, after uh, delivery. And so people are watching that and we're following a group now, for example, in the Central Valley in California, but mm. it is important to follow because we need to see to what extent that heat effect in as a woman who's pregnant affects also her child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, many people may be familiar with this idea of heat stress or heat stroke in older people or in, you know, um, children who are athletes, and we, we kind of can conceptualize that, but there's also really important effects of heat on our youngest children in terms of their behavior and sleep um, and their learning. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. It's really important to know that our bodies were really meant to be at around 75 degrees Fahrenheit outside. We might be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit inside our body, but that's not what we like outside. And so especially children, you know, they can get cranky. They don't sleep so well. It's really hard because they're metabolizing so fast. Infants also have that nice layer of fat. Typically, it's hard for them to go to sleep and it's hard for them to stay asleep because they're constantly trying to cool themselves. 
So it's really important to develop methods by which to make it more comfortable for early child uh, development, as well as uh, infants and babies and toddlers. So with that in mind, knowing that that age group is much more sensitive, there's a lot of downstream issues that happen. If you're cranky, if you can't eat as well, you just don't feel hungry. You also don't want to play outside as much. Those are types of interactions that are really important for the cognitive development of any child in early development. The other problem is that we know that in early child development, every degree Fahrenheit increase on the outside environment can actually lead to a 1% decrease in test scores. Now, we're not scoring the average toddler. We know that in terms of tests. But it's important to know that it affects the brain. It affects how the brain is going to function. And so, again, our body's not meant to be in greater areas than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So optimally, we don't want to have to work in that type of temperature or develop in that type of temperature that's higher than that. And when it does get higher, our brain literally does not function as well. And we have data on that for children. Um, and I think too, as a mother, I can remember having three small children and how sort of my own behavior and ability to regulate my own emotions changes in a room that's you know, 98 degrees and humid and how that affects the foundational relationship when I show up for those young children, you know, it's stress on me that translates to my ability to be present and provide the things that are so important for child development. And I've, I've learned too that, it, is it true that, um, you know, we almost need a subtle drop in temperature to facilitate sleep onset? And so for, and when we don't have that, you know, you mentioned trouble falling asleep and having more frequent wakings, true of children, and then also the adults who are having more disrupted sleep, who sh can then, you know, be available in a really different way the next day, um, you know, feels <laughs> important. And when we think about, you know, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hey, you're absolutely right. We're trying to create the best environments indirect and directly for our children. And uh, when adults don't get good sleep, which oftentimes happens uh, when it's hot, you're right, we need to adjust a little lower temperature to be able to just fall asleep for any of us on, on this earth. But uh, I do worry about this because indirectly heat and living in uh, high areas where there might be violence, the, the violence actually increases um, outside and inside the household. And children, unfortunately, are sometimes the the victims of this violence or see it and it's very stressful to them. Mm -hmm. So heat, heat affects how we behave as adults and it also affects some other behaviors that uh, are irreversibly damaging to children. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so many of the, what we know about how heat changes behavior and leads to increase in, in different types of violence, as you mentioned, is kind of more measured and available in adults. I think it's more difficult to measure, or I think we haven't yet, but it would be really interesting to understand how heat really affects um, the behavior of toddlers and young children, because I think there it makes sense that their ability to regulate their own emotions is gonna be maybe even more sensitive than ours. And we know that this is something that's affecting adults. So we can only assume that it's gonna affect kids, you know, as much, if not more. Um, and, you know, our conversations about sleep and behavior got me thinking about like where children spend a lot of their time. And I think in particular, many infants spend much of their sleep time and their time, you know, their early learning time in early care and education settings, including those that happen in, in home settings. Um, so how do you think about what we need to be thinking about in terms of adapting to increasing temperatures, both indoors and outdoors when it comes to those particular settings? Yeah, I think so many of our children, especially if they're in nursery schools or in daycare settings, we need to make sure that on the whole, we can create better structures to deal with this heat all throughout uh, the world and the U.S. So let's talk about that because that's important. We talked about climate change. We've talked about heat stress. There are ways to mitigate and adapt to climate change that include biodiversification that have fantastic mm. effects on children and how they're growing. Mm. So part of those solutions in daycare centers, in schools, at our own homes can include biodiversification, can include green and real green. And the reason that's important is because part of the simple ways to help 
decrease heat exposure is to offer shade. So let's just talk about what are some of the really typical things that one can use practically at home or at a nursery school or at a daycare center to just help reduce heat. Number one, if it's gonna be hot outside, please make sure you monitor the NOAA website, websites that we can provide you links for. They're also provided, um, I believe, uh, Lindsay, in the report. The report mm -hmm. from the Center for the Developing Child is fantastic, by the way, and I hope everyone will read it because it offers such great resources to citizens. And I'm really proud of it because there's so much science in it that can really be tangibly used right now in real time. So what does this mean? Let's talk about solutions on the individual level for heat. First, go to shade. If you're outside, seek a shaded place. If you're inside, make sure that it's shady, not in some sun exposed area. Second, if there's no air conditioner, if there's no central air feature that can cool the room, then get a fan, get a bowl of ice underneath that fan, and that can reduce the temperatures up to five degrees Fahrenheit quickly in any given room. And so those are some low cost ways to really make sure that you can introduce a cooling system into an area, especially with children uh, running around that wanna play, mm -hmm. that wanna be interactive. The other thing is to get cool washcloths and make sure that any skin exposed Take away as much clothes as you can, but just cool off the skin because that'll help it evaporate better. Mm -hmm. Humidity um, can also reduce the likelihood of evaporation. So anything that we can do to decrease humidity is good. So, so getting that skin cool will allow it to evaporate more as well. And then finally, making sure that the children are hydrated, the babies are hydrated, and the people taking care of them mm -hmm. are hydrated. So um, all of these things are simple, easy steps to do. The first step, though, is monitor and monitor well. Now, most cities, most places around our country, at least in the U.S., and many places around the world have alert systems to let you know if there's going to be a heat wave. And that's important because then we can start getting ready. And so I give a list of things to prepare for on the individual basis. But these are things that can also be done on the public scale to scale it up across uh, any given area that's affected by a heat wave. Um, but I love the fan and bowl of ice tip. I can just like picture and almost feel how <laughs> that would cool a room and is something that, you know, is potentially accessible to a lot of people. Um, now, we've been learning a lot and I think there's a big range of programs that are doing some incredible work, you know, places like the NC State Designs Natural Learning Initiative that are thinking about how to bring green space and outdoor environments um, to children for a number of reasons. And you and I have had conversations before, and I would love to kind of talk about it here about how these naturalized learning environments, particularly with really young children in these early care and education settings have such co-benefits, both when it comes to our biology, sort of what happens underneath the skin and then what happens in a range of benefits for children's development and learning um, and kind of social emotional health. So can you speak a little bit of, to those and, and also the benefits that it has in terms of lowering temperature? Because it's one of these, when you start listing off all the great things that this does, it really just seems like a win, 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 win. It really is. Um, and in all humility, we're learning a lot more about the wins that seem to be exponential in value, especially to young children. So Let's let's talk about that more. So I think that's important for the audience to know that a lot of people now are studying this concept of natural outdoor exposures, especially in children. And there's a whole sort of system now, both adults and children, called natural capital. The investment that we take in nature and how we can ex get exposed to it more purposefully so that we can help ourselves. It also decreases heat when we're in nature with trees. And of course, plants themselves, they can emit carbon, but they also sequester carbon. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of good things about plants. Let's talk first about the good things for our brain with plants and with greenery. So we know that one of the great benefits of being outdoors, not on a screen that shows outdoors, actually being outdoors and walking and making mental pictures and photographs of wonderful things outside with our children and being able to make sure even in infants to get outdoors and inhale and be part of nature 
that really helps cognitive development. There are many studies now to show that that helps stimulate your brain. Children do better overall in tests once they get exposed to the outdoors, even for an hour in between recess. They go outside, get exposed to green, not mm -hmm. cement tops, but green in, in the case of this uh, study that was done in Australia, where children in nursery schools got exposed to green during an hour after during their school recess, and they actually did better coming back in with uh, a similar controlled study. So with all that in mind, green is good for the brain, especially infants and developing brain. Green is also good for tactile learning. And when people have done studies on nursery schools that have green grass and dirt compared to a typical playground that does not, that just has rubberized uh, mats, the children that are exposed to the dirt and play around in the grass, not only do they learn more and they're more academically aware of things later in life, but in addition, they get microbiome, they get good bacteria established in their gut that actually helps their immune system. So a study was done in Finland compared to a controlled group with all other measures controlled for, and they found that the children that were playing more in the dirt, were exposed to grass and trees, that they had a different microbiome system in their gut and that that actually helped their immune system. And they had, and that was measured by how well they responded to vaccines. So this is really important. This is a win, 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 win. Cognitive development, tactile development, good microbiome in the gut, good immune system, and then good protection against infections. Yeah, and it's lowering temperatures. At the same time, yeah. exactly the same time. <laughs> that's amazing. And I love this space because it really feels like a place where whether you're in philanthropy or policy or already in an early care and education setting, like it feels like that's something that we can do to kind of bring <laughs> all of these co-benefits into these settings. So it feels like a real place for hope. Absolutely. It is. It's I, I am very hopeful. And there are many more people doing work on here with rewilding environments, making sure that in that process of greening, we green schools and green nursery schools first, that we prioritize that because we know how important that is for developing children. Yeah. So when we start to think about, you know, how we target some of these investments or our attention to make sure that we're, you know, creating the greatest benefits for children, you know, I've through, you know, things that you've taught me and the other members of the council really kind of built an understanding that yeah, heat is not affecting all groups of children equally. And really there's so many factors like your socioeconomic status, your nutrition, living conditions, where you live geographically, what your stage is in development. And, you know, these things all shape the way that children experience heat and the types of heat that, uh, types of effects that heat can have on their development. So can you talk a little bit about how heat, you know, sort of amplifies some of these other more systemic inequities and how heat, if these effects of heat can be compounded in areas, say, where air quality may already be more of a challenge. Right. I'm really glad that at the Center for the Developing Child, you know, you brought us all together in a council to talk about these difficult things and they're complex, but that doesn't mean we should step away from them. It means we need to really focus in and understand them better, understand how to prioritize solutions. And I'm glad that at your center, you've exactly done that. And so kudos to you for being able to have a webinar like this and being able to have systematic ways to approach difficult conversations. And one thing that we're learning with climate change is it's really been the x-ray into our soul of health inequities, x-ray into the soul of a lot of communities, especially those including children of color, those including children that get displaced to the climate change. We have over 200 million people displaced every year to climate change associated events. And about 80 to 90% of those displaced are women and children. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how this affects children on the long-term scale and specifically heat because it is so directly related to climate change. But like you said, when you have heat, and you're already inequitably exposed to things like air pollution. If you live in a community of color, unfortunately, you're gonna have a higher risk as a child to being exposed to toxins. Uh, and that's unfortunate because of something called red zoning and redlining that were part of our real estate practices. Uh, now they're not, but still we have communities that 
are highly exposed inequitably. And so what happens is if you have heat stress, if you're already exposed to air pollution or toxic chemicals, which happens a lot in our underserved, marginalized communities, people of color, people that necessarily have been discriminated against in our country, and traditionally, unfortunately, Native Americans and original peoples across the world, those children really have some of the worst statistics for being able to deal with heat uh, because they have underlying issues. And unfortunately, we also have an issue around nutrition and good nutrition practices. And for many communities where they might not have access to healthy food, there's a lot of obesity. And that very much affects how people respond, especially children, to heat stress. Mm -hmm. So with all that in mind, we need to really think about the most vulnerable, the most inequitably exposed, because if we can't help them as children, as toddlers, as babies, then who are we as a society? Because it's those children we should be focusing on first because they are going to need the most help. And so a lot of work is being done. And so I'm hopeful that the your report is coming out. You talk about these inequitably exposed children and some of these vulnerable communities that we really need to make sure we understand and understand the multiplying effect of these exposures over time. Not only in any given day could a child be exposed to heat, air pollution, drought, perhaps a vector-borne disease or an, an a stress event in it for their mental health. But in addition, it compounds over the life course, like you said, mm-hmm. over time. So they have a higher chance of having these issues. But I'm hopeful that there are solutions now. The EPA is putting out heat risk indices for children, mm-hmm. especially those in what we call these communities that are inequitably exposed, environmental justice communities. Also, the CDC has a new heat, ri- heat risk index. So you can go online as members of the public, search the internet and go to the EPA your Center for the Developing Child Report, as well as the CDC's, the Center, it's basically the Center for Disease Control. And of those information packets, you're going to find a lot about heat stress and how to help communities. And I'm really grateful that our government has these systematic ways to help the public now. Yeah, it's really amazing. I think the um, amount of attention that this topic is getting and how children are being brought into the conversation. I think even a couple of years ago, there maybe weren't this type of robust, you know, sources of information about how to stay safe with heat. And now I think the EPA resources, and thank you for the kind words about our report, but just kind of getting these, um, this information out to people who are taking care of young children every day feels really important. And I sort of have heard you kind of throughout our talk name, almost like three real levels of solutions, right? Sort of like, we need to take some immediate actions to keep people safe when these heat waves happen. But we also need to think about how are we adapting our systems, our services, our infrastructure, because as you said, you know, this was the coolest summer and that we'll see going forward. So how do we, you know, adapt to that new reality? But then also, you know, and you got to this, I think, a little bit when it came to the early care and education settings, like how do we stop the reasons why the planet is warming so much in the first place by decreasing our reliance on fossil fuels and, you know, decrease our um, greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, thinking about those three levels of solutions, is there anything that you've learned from your work um, with workers in California or in other places about how we can think about solutions, particularly in urban heat islands where temperatures are much higher? um, And can we think about applying those solutions um, to children and to pregnant individuals? Yeah, I think there are a lot of solutions now, and I'm really grateful. So when we talk, think about climate change, so many of our solutions have immediate effects on heat. And that's great because we want to stop warming our planet. It's not good. We see so many issues around that warming of the planet with drought, with wildfire smokes, with water insecurity, with food insecurity. Heat. Plants don't like heat either. Yeah. So <laughs> we want to make sure that we think about the whole earth, uh, this whole concept of one health, planetary health, animals, plants, everything, heat especially uh, affects them. And so there are ways to adapt to heat, like I talked about with on the individual levels, but on the on the other levels of adaptation and planting more tree canopy, for example, in cities, urban heat islands are real. Uh, Many people feel that when they are in the inner city Chicago or inner city Harlem or inner city New York City, they're going to have degrees up to five degrees Fahrenheit more in some of the heat islands compared to, let's say, rural areas. 
So that's real. And so what's happening now is people are realizing, again, thanks to that whole concept of natural capital, planting trees in cities especially, and children are going to basically benefit from these tree planting exercises. Plant trees up to increasing tree canopy by, by 30%, decreases premature deaths by 30%. That's incredible. And it reduces yeah. temperature by 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's great. That's that's substantial. That helps maintain good health and decreases the risks of heat stress and heat stroke for not just children, but also for everyone. So, and that's just a 30% canopy increase. Could you imagine 50%? So, and then the trees will also help absorb carbon. And the most important thing for those of you who have allergies to trees, it's actually not going to increase allergies. And that's mm -hmm. also important. If you plant mixed sex trees, you reduce allergies. Uh -huh. And so it's very cool that we see so many benefits of these systematic ways that cities and communities can actually push for these policy changes. And they are happening around the country in front of you on the phone. Please talk to your town councils about increasing tree canopy and planting the right trees. And I'm happy to help in any way. I've done a lot of work with different towns in planting trees. The other thing that people are doing more and more is actually using cooling paint. So if you use white paint on roofs or even green roofing, having natural roofs like grass and other things that are happening more in cities like Paris or just planting sod roofs, for example, that's done very much in certain cultures, that white roofs and sod roofs, solar panels also reflect light so that that rooftop does not absorb light. So solar panels, white roofs, green, real green grass roofs, for example, they all help a lot reduce the absorption of that heat. And then there's new technologies coming out for cooling sidewalks. We're doing that in Springfield, Massachusetts, for example, now. There's also examples of cooling pumps that you can install into your home and you don't need to leave the home. These are low cost methods. And importantly is talk to your local council, talk to your state, because nowadays states actually give subsidies for air conditioning, for cooling pumps, for offering access to cooling rooms, for example. I know that's maybe not as easy as having cooling places in your own um, backyard or your own home, but there are now uh, public cooling rooms available, especially in areas of the country that deal with heat uh, stress. And then finally, public places are being offered as ways to cool, um, cool areas. Now, we are still missing a lot for schools. We need to do a lot more directed work for uh, public schools and private schools for children and nursery schools. So I think when we wrote our EPA report for the Children's Protection Committee, we did say we have to systematically make sure that on the public side that we reduce temperatures in these key areas that are taking care of children. Um, so we're on the road to these types of practices, but I'm really glad to see a lot of cities starting to adapt them now. Yeah. You talked a little bit about heat pumps. So if somebody's new to the concept of a heat pump, can you explain a little bit both kind of what that looks like, why it may or may not have advantages over air conditioning? And then for both of those technologies, you know, one thing that people ask me about a lot is, you know, we have this very old building. It's, it would take a lot of investment to, to think about. Um, you know, the EPA I know has done a lot of thinking about cost effectiveness and, and what that actually means in terms of investment versus benefits. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, uh, I'm not a heat pump expert. And when people think heat pump, they're like, oh, well, you're making heat for me. That's true. Uh, the same pump in the wintertime can make heat for you in the summertime uh, can make cool. So it's, I call it a pump. Uh, and so they can install this in homes. I I've seen them. They are at the current time, they can be very energy efficient. So they don't take as much energy as let's say an air conditioner, which mm -hmm. is good because we want to decrease the use of greenhouse gas uh, energy components, increase the ability to use renewable energies and heating pumps are one of those systematic ways of being able to adapt to more renewable energy devices. So Overall, what, this, for example, the city of Boston's doing, as well as other cities around the country, as well as communities, not just cities, they're looking at these pumps because they're more energy efficient. You can install them into your home now without a lot of issues and without disrupting normal living. 
And they don't require as much energy, let's say, as air conditioners do, because people probably know air conditioners use some toxins that then get emitted into the environment, and they're actually really bad for greenhouse gases. And so we want to make sure that the very same solutions that we're using for cooling do not turn into solutions that actually turn out to be worse for our environment and can start Mm -hmm. to increase climate change. So that's where the pumps are actually really helpful. But if you have any other um, suggestions... No, I, I, I no, I found them like so amazing when I first learned about it because you hear pump and you sort of think that it's going to like, I don't know, work off of some type of, you know, coolant like the air conditioners, but they actually in the winter, it's kind of amazing, draw heat out of the air, even when temperatures are well below zero. I think the state of Maine has done this at scale and they actually warm many environments, you know, much more evenly than traditional cooling methods. And then at the same time, you know, um, they're able to draw in the summer months that energy and that heat out of the air and actually put it back into the earth in a way that is also, you know, cooling to the to the degree of air conditioners without those negative effects of the greenhouse gas emissions. I think, you know, many exactly. of us are surprised when we learn that air conditioning may actually not be great for the environment, but, you know, if you have the ability to put some type of air conditioning in a place where children sleep or where children live and you can lower that temperature, I think we've learned that the effects on learning actually are really important when you lower those temperatures and that there's significant costs associated with the learning losses and the days lost of school and that actually even though you have to invest and put that money into air conditioning, you're sort of regaining, you know, the losses that would have happened in so many other ways because of heat. Um, And I think when it comes to young children, especially that ability to like play and explore and just be curious and be able to move around your environment comfortably is so intangible and hard to measure. But thinking about how to get these technologies into places where young children spend time feels, you know, so important. So um, I love that you... Yeah, I mean, it's it's great just to think about that there's solutions at so many levels that really no matter where we sit, you know, we have to you know, we can start to think about, you know, what we can do to make these make environments more um, comfortable for kids. So, you know, if you had to think about if you were working in an early care and education setting, if you were in a school, you know, we've talked about a couple different temperature numbers and ranges today. Is there you could wave a magic wand and say, I would love for these little infants to be able to play and live and sleep at this temperature and these toddlers. Is there a range that you think is helpful for the audience to know about? I think 70 to 75 is helpful. I think that that gives us leeway, uh, but, you know, that's where we're coming down now. But obviously, we want to know what's harmful so that we don't get to those temperatures. And that's like 85 and above. Um, And again, all this comes conditionally with making sure you're hydrated, making sure that there's humidity um, and dryness uh, differences. So, so with all that in mind, though, Lindsay, it is so important to try to be that change. Now with this information, I hope that your audience will take it forward on the individual level, but also to knock on the doors of your town council, to knock on the doors of your local government and say, hey, you know, can you give subsidies for cooling pumps for certain neighborhoods? Can you make sure that they're in schools? Can you make sure that we deal with good aeration? You know, just a little bit of wind will help with evaporation and will help reduce temperature a lot. So I hope that all these things that we've talked about today will be helpful to your audience, but it's important that we as a community really advocate for children, for infants, for toddlers, because we as adults, I think that is our um, our privilege to be able to make sure that we can take care of everyone on this planet, especially those that are early in life. Yeah, thank you. And I learned so much every time I have a conversation with you about this. I wish that I could be like taking notes while we're talking so I can go back and learn more about all these great things. Um, Is there anything that you would give as sort of a takeaway or, you know, a final recommendation for people who really want to bring this home? I love the thought about coming to your lawmakers, coming to your local government. Is there anything that you would put forward as, you know, something that gets you up and into this work every day with hope and forward looking? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining. I am very hopeful that we can, through biodiversification, through getting access to more natural environments, actually help our children, especially in early development. And I also am very hopeful that 
uh, because there's areas of the world that are dealing with extreme heat, greater than 40 degrees centigrade, you know, greater than 110 degrees Fahrenheit. This is happening more and more in the news. These are areas that I really do hope we can also think about how are those children affected um, and what access can we make sure immediately we can provide to them for healthier lives. Yeah. Thank you, Kari. This is terrific. We're so grateful for your time and your expertise and um, for everything that you taught us today. So I'm going to turn it back over to our host and thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you again in a future conversation. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Burkhart and Dr. Nato, for this wonderful conversation today. Um, before we close out, I just would like to give everyone in the audience an opportunity to share feedback on this discussion. On screen, you should be able to see a QR code to access that survey. And I believe we're also pasting the link into the chat. And we really welcome any thoughts or takeaways or questions that you all have about everything that was covered and discussed today. Um, I also just wanted to quickly note that we have several additional webinars in development for later this spring and summer, where we'll talk more about different aspects of the developmental environment and other topics related to early childhood development. So please be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter to receive updates and find registration information. And finally, thank you again to you, our audience, for being here today. We're so grateful to have you with us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.